So I'm Ross Caps, and I'm being flanked here by Brandon's compatriots, Tim and Chris. And we essentially put this together by brainstorming the other night, and I had a, a couple fears. My first fear was I was actually going to be asked to do this, and that I would have the semblance of composure to actually do it. That remains to be seen. Number two, if I did it, would I give justice to him? Would I do him justice? Because I found that I'm just not that good with words. I'm not good enough to put it down, to let you know what an amazing person he was. But we're going to give it a go. I just want to let you know that Jesse did his speech independent of mine, but you will see some common threads. So you will know that this was exactly who he was. <clears throat> 9 11, 2001, was a day in which terrorists attacked our country on our own soil. It was a day where thousands of people lost their lives. More importantly, it was a day in which heroes showed their true color. First responders ran into danger, not away from it. Civilians on Flight 93 sacrificed themselves to save the lives of others. 9-11 is a day to honor heroes, those still living and those who have fallen. If it had to happen, if it really had to happen, that we were to lose our brother, how fitting that he sacrificed his life protecting ours on 9-11. I was so pleased to see how the family of the car he had pulled over that night recognized that. They described him as kind and humble and as their guardian angel. Brandon be came between them and danger. He's my personal hero. He's our hero. How apropos that we'll be able to remember him and honor our hero and his legacy alongside all of the other fallen heroes on the day of heroes, 9-11. So how was I privileged to befriend Brandon Collins? Make no mistake, it was a privilege. Anyone who actually got to know him could not disagree with that. Sergeant Mills told me he actually felt sorry for the people who didn't get to know him. They didn't get a chance to know him. I wholeheartedly concur. He was everything you can ask for in a coworker, a confidant, and a friend. So in October 1995, Brandon began working at the Johnson County Sheriff's Office. In January 96, I began working for his department as well. A cousin of mine at that time was working there. He highly recommended that I get to know Collins because he was so funny and he thought we had similar interests. I went with it. It wasn't long into our first conversation when I realized we were kindred spirits. The commonality seemed essentially endless. We could talk about just about anything and had some semblance of common ground. This spanned the gamut. First, our maturity level, I think, was frozen at about the equivalent of a 10-year-old's. Sports was always a good common ground. Granted, I wasn't an expert in Oklahoma sports lore, but I had a just enough knowledge to make me credible in his eyes. We both grew up watching professional wrestling, so we were able to talk about the likes of Coco Beware and the Von Erics. We both had a soft spot for some really, really bad movies. I can't speak for myself, but Brandon, of course, enjoyed anything the Boz was in, regardless of how bad it was. And it was just a level of how bad they actually were. We did find some common ground in the early works of Steven Seagal. Brandon really saw opportunity when my niece started dating and eventually married Rich, because that meant any time Rich was mentioned in a conversation, he had the green light to use Seagal's line and out for justice. Probably some of you have heard it. Anybody see Richie? Anybody know why he did Bobby Lupo? 
We both were cursed with sensitive stomachs. I know Tracy appreciated Brandon having someone he could share that experience with and discuss such issues. In fact, we discovered on our various rock and roll road trips that any form of dough-wrapped meat didn't live in harmony, just didn't jive with Brandon's digestive system. However, the most important thing we shared was our taste, and as many might say, the lack of taste in music. We both grew up on 80s metal. The best part of that tight tie that bound us together was our evolution of musical tastes. It was almost identical. We were kindred spirits. Friedrich Nietzsche said, without music, life would be a mistake. I don't know that quote because I am a student of philosophy. I actually heard Henry Winkler's music teacher character in Here Comes the Boom say it. And did I mention bad movies? But nonetheless, it's a real quote. It's absolutely legit. Uh, and regardless of your interpretation, it, it's poignant. Music bound us together. It tied us at the hip. It was the source of so much camaraderie and joy for us. I want to get back to movies for just a moment. This particular one of interest wasn't a bad movie whatsoever. In fact, it was a wonderful movie, and my guess is Brandon never saw it. It was called St. Vincent. Bill Murray, Vincent, was the crotchety old man. He was the next-door neighbor to the new kid on the block, Oliver. So Vincent did a bit of, a bit of watching of Oliver after, the, after school so they could get to know one, one another. And Vincent showed Oliver every vice known to man. And one scene depicts Vincent sitting in his backyard after his wife had passed away from a long battle with dementia. And Oliver tells Vincent, sorry, Ben, for your loss. And Vincent responds, never understood why people say that. Oliver responds back, they don't know what else to say. Vincent says, how about, what was she like? Do you miss her? What are you going to do now? What was he like? He was amazing. I want to clarify, I'm not filling this with embellishments much like Brandon tended to do upon any given retelling of a story. He always denied the embellishment. Nonetheless, it was true, he embellished. And I'm not saying he did it purposely. Maybe like Andy Pettit, he just misremembered. Brandon was all about the family, his biological family, his non-biological family. He was all about spending time with the girls, including Jojo the Wonder Dog. It was free, fairly frequent that I would ask him if he wanted to go somewhere, but he would decline because he hadn't got to spend time with the family due to his shift work. And I understood that. Brandon would travel to Oklahoma nearly every weekend during the football season to see his nephew play his high school football games. Now, working shifts, that wasn't an easy task. It might take switching shifts, vacation leave, or simply driving down, watching the game, and driving right back. He attended Tim's son's football games, grade school through high school. He would travel out of state to see Deputy Denton compete in boxing matches. He was fiercely loyal and dependable. Brandon had that it, that something that was magnetic. He had that savoir-faire. He was genuinely, genuinely a nice guy. And a nice guy to everyone, everyone, no matter who you were. His ability to do hand tricks for the kids and make fart noises for the kids and adults alike was like watching perfection in action. The timing in and of itself was something to behold in a crowded elevator or when someone was bending over. You could always count on him to break up a stressful situation with a smart aleck comment, uh, that's what she said, or a fart noise. His personality was nothing short of engaging. It was infectious. No matter who you were, he could talk to you like you knew him for years. People who met him were almost instantaneously in love with him, and that was all genuine. Those of us close to him, we knew him as family. And he maintained those relationships and those friendships. He still had friends from high school, college, Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, 
the DEA task force, the courthouse, the gas station, the watering holes, the live music clubs, and on and on and on. He just never had to say goodbye because he was always just a phone call away. Speaking of the phone calls, he was the hub of information and we were simply the spokes. Everything funneled through him. Information for dissemination was released, but things said in confidence were locked down never to see the light of day. Tim eloquently described Brandon as the crisis management counselor. Regardless of whether it was good, bad, indifferent, or involved in OEU loss, we always called Brandon. Communication was right in Brandon's wheelhouse. Tim's weekly trips to and from St. Louis, they were tolerable thanks to those phone conversations with Brandon. My sister, my sister wasn't a stranger to calling Brandon if she knew he was working mids, and she was too. It's my understanding that conversations typically revolved around Brandon keeping my sister up to date on my ailments. Topics included my eye strain, my past struggles with low-grade fevers, and my ongoing battle with tendonitis. Man, it's, it's good to be loved. Brandon also mastered the art of prank calls. After a late night of good live music, he developed the itch for the prank call. In fact, if you ever worked a midnight in central control, the odds are you received one of those calls and you may not even have known it. He was our heart, the glue that brought disparate people together. We have relationships with one another that wouldn't have existed had it not been for him connecting our dots. Brandon brought us together, but he was also not a stranger to stirring the pot. Oddly enough, one of the best pot stirring stories I have involves Pechnik. Go figure, huh guys? Brandon Pechnik and I were making a road trip to Nashville, down where my sister was. I rented a car, so I was the primary driver. However, I begrudgingly made Pechnik the secondary driver. Anyone who knows Pechnik understands why I might not necessarily want to let him drive, yet for some odd reason, he has a compulsion to backseat drive any and all vehicles in which he happens to be the passenger, as if he was the driver's ed instructor complex. Brandon essentially made me swear on all things that were holy, that no matter what, no matter what, I would not let Pechnik drive. I'm like, no. No problem, I, I don't understand why this is even an issue. You think I'm gonna argue with you on that? So we pick up Pechnik, and this is no exaggeration. This is, this is not a Brandon embellishment. We were literally with 100 yards of the first turn. I turn left, Pechnik immediately says, why are you going this way? Right on cue, Brandon yells up from the back seat, yeah, Pechnik, why don't you drive? Brandon's scheme was revealed. That was the beginning of about a nine hour trip of Brandon goading Pechnik on, insisting he should drive. I wouldn't even need to glance at my phone. If he so much as heard a text or the, the phone ring, he would immediately suggest Pechnik drive so I could use my phone. Nine hours. Along that same vein, Anyone who played poker with Brandon was subject to his antagonistic, this game is easy, when he won a hand, which was often, unfortunately. Those poker games were so enjoyable, but now as I look back, I realize what a card shark he was. He'd lure us over with the promise of Tracy's Rotel and brownies, and we'd leave with nothing more than empty pockets, brownie-induced insulin dumps, and broken dreams. Those poker games, however, were the grounds on which Brandon really got to know my family. He beat up on the likes of my mom, my dad, my uncle, my cousins, my sister, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my father-in-law. So I guess getting smacked around at the poker table by Brandon was a badge of honor, a rite of passage. What Brandon was, he was also, he's quite a handyman. When he purchased his home, his list of Tools included a hammer, pliers, and a butter knife in lieu of a screwdriver, none of which he could proficiently operate. 
In fact, he struggled to mow his lawn. Speaking of mowing lawns, a few weeks ago, he needed my minivan to deliver his new lawnmower. So I was very concerned because it came in a box, which meant to me some assembly required. So we unloaded it in his basement, and I left, and I wondered what would that finished product look like when a hammer, pliers, and butter knife were used to put it together. Tracy, I had plans to mow your lawn tomorrow morning with your new lawnmower, but I think it's going to be in the afternoon because I believe the morning is going to be reserved for a comprehensive safety inspection, or at least an assurance that a butter knife can actually uh, attach the blade to the deck. But you'd think coming from a small rural town in Oklahoma, he'd at least be able to operate a butter knife. But in reality, he was actually as un-Oklahoma as one could be and still actually hail from that state. I know you've seen the early pictures of Brandon in which his mullet made Billy Ray Cyrus as laughable. Don't let that Duck Dynasty redneck look fool you. He didn't hunt, he didn't fish, he didn't camp. He didn't know the difference between a cow and a steer. No, he was more of a fashionista. He was very serious about those name brand clothes and shoes. He was a cologne connoisseur as well, because if, if you weren't wearing Gucci or Mont Blanc, you might as well be wearing Brute or Electric Shave. But what Brandon really excelled in was the nicknames. Nothing fascinated my wife more than Brandon's use of nicknames. He may not have originated all of them, but what he did do is he perfected the art of delivery. Since we're in the house of worship, Pastor, I've stricken or abbreviated about 86.2% of them. <laughs> but the three of us brainstormed and we came up with a list that maybe were appropriate somewhat, hopefully. So, you may know them. If so, keep the information to yourself, and if not, don't ask questions. Do not ever ask questions. Just go with it. So we're going to start with Brandon. These were abbreviated. JB, Lou, OQ, long hair, and as my wife lovingly referred to him, the ride mooch. And she often referred to him as my girlfriend, because I guess we did a lot of talking and sharing time together. So I can live with that. Others, in no particular order, CP. The Chuck Wagon, Powder Wig, Piss Pants Dan, Stephen, AL, Felony Melanie, Little House on the Prairie, BTA, Beamer Jim, Exxon Valdez, Let's Get 'em Girls, Walleye, Orville Redenbacher, Feats, Man Love, my bad, that is actually a real name. Pam Bennett, the rodeo clown, Omar, Westbound and Down, Cowboy Bill Willis, Fred the Fed, Ron. Speaking of Ron, this kind of brings me back. If you ever had a conversation, we all had the conversations with Brandon. If you were complaining about somebody, he would always offer up, you want me to talk to him? So a conversation would go like this. I saw him, Brandon, I saw Ron the last couple days and he looks like he's getting soft. I'm a little concerned about it. He'd say, you want me to talk to him? But I'm gonna take it from here. Ron, I know you're getting a little soft. I think if you just include a few more reps, a little heavier weight, you're gonna, you're gonna get over the top. Poopy pants, tea bag, tubuku, tubuku, Buddha, number two. Number one, the long stroke. Gene Genie, Maverick, Nirvana, Gadget, Figgity, Mort, 20 G's, also known as Johnny Two Dimes, or Two Dimes for short, Rat Patrol, Johnny Appleseed, The Godmother, Big Ange, Gazer, Red, I got a little story, if, if I got time faster, just to talk about red. So, <laughs> red's red, but red didn't know he was red. So I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag, he already knows. Greg Wright, you were red. You were red 20 years ago. 
What happened is he, he's prematurely gray, but in all actuality, he looks really good. And I read somewhere like in Cosmo that chicks like the gray hair. So, but he dyed it and it just didn't take well and he had red hair. So we commenced to calling him red. And I mean, it wasn't meant to be derogatory. So, but we never called him red to his face until a few years ago, we're playing poker and this story involves Pechnik again, oddly enough. He keeps calling him Red at the table, and we're all like, what is, what is what's going on? Red, it's your, it's your turn. Yeah, it's your run. Uh, yeah, Red, yo. So Preston goes to the bathroom, and Red says, why is that stupid SOB keep calling me Red? And we all looked at each other. <laughs> You know, Patchnick, we can't answer that. <laughs> so we're going to get to Patchnick. Le Biche. You probably all know that. So this all started, Sergeant Chalk sort of named him uh, Bitchnik once. And I said, well, you know, he's a world traveler. He's a, he's, uh, you know, he goes to Europe all the time. I'm thinking we can morph that into to Bijnik. And so it morphed into Bijnik, and then I was talking to my son, who is fluent in French. I said, you know, what, what, would, what would that be? And uh, if I, I thought Pepe Le Pew, he was like, lay this, lay that, lay Pew. And so he's like, it would be Le Bige. Le Bige was born. And then I said, well, you know, he's got two Austrian brother-in-laws, so if he goes over there, they speak German, what would it be? It'd be Der Bige. <sighs> so still on the topic of Le Bige, I had an Andy uh, Rooney-esque moment one time with Brandon, and I said, have you ever noticed uh, Bij rep repeats things twice? <sighs> like he'd say, who cares, who cares? <laughs> and Brandon knew exactly what I was talking about, and it, it was almost like he was waiting for me to notice, and without missing a beat, Chrissy two times was born. <laughs> Not only was it a, a proper noun, but it morphed into a verb as well. So if you ever got that double whammy in a conversation with Lebige, you just got Chrissy two times. <laughs> During another conversation with Brandon, we discussed Ned Yost's fondness for nicknames, truncating the name or adding a Y. So new names emerged from there. We had Spicy and Bigey and Brownie. And let's be clear, Brownie is two dimes, who is also 20 Gs or Johnny two dimes. Mally, Gerky, and my personal favorite was Manny for man love. So man love, let's be clear, man love's the real name, Manny is the nickname, based off man love. In the spirit of Ned, an S could also be added. For example, uh, for example, uh, Newton became Newts. But maybe his love for nicknames was born out of the, the nickname-ridden world of sports. And make no mistake, he was a sports buff a true student of the game. He could read formations, understand strategy and clock management, but he just couldn't play them so good. So he turned into an OU super fan. Everyone has to be good at something, so that led him to try his hand at music. Oh, he knew his musical history already, but he decided to self-educate himself with guitar. He learned all the various brands, pickups, string gauges, amps, effects pedals and the works. We all got the call from him asking for us to listen to something he learned to play. Brandon's mom and I discussed this very topic and we were both in the same boat, bracing, hoping, praying we would recognize something, anything he played. <laughs> now, when Tim was put to that test, he always had an answer. And that answer was always my Sharona. <laughs> Only country music and nonsensical concert t-shirts bothered Brandon more than Tim's incessant my Sharona jab. Well, much like his sports skills, the guitar skills just wasn't very good. So he became a super groupie. And when I say super groupie, I don't mean a groupie of super groups. I mean a super groupie of groups who we were, as I like to put it, hidden gems or those lesser known bands. So it seems all roads lead back to music where Brandon is concerned. He loved it. It was a big part of his life. 
He wanted to make sure his daughters were exposed to it. He recently took Ashley to her first concert. It was the Rolling Stones at Arrowhead Stadium. And a few weeks later, he took her to One Direction at Arrowhead. It's ironic, though, because Ashley has attended two concerts where tens of thousands of fans were present. Brandon and, I, Brandon and I have attended at least 50 times that number of club shows with literally tens of people in attendance. So, do we miss him? I can't remotely express to you how much we miss him. I'm going to miss the brother I never had growing up. We'll miss his embellished stories. We'll miss giving him grief, especially about the latest OU loss but we'll also miss getting grief from him. Well, I believe that was for just about everything. Everything was on the table as far as he was concerned. We'll miss him making us laugh with his jokes, comments, nicknames, and noises. We'll miss those free daily crisis management sessions, those phone conversations that were priceless to all of us. I'll personally miss him standing in the background, grinning as perfect strangers would approach me to inquire about my legendary swabbing skills. Those who laugh understand. I miss, I'm gonna miss our rock and roll partner, my rock and roll partner and going to the local gigs and especially the rock and roll road trips. His peers in the field will miss having his back because you know he always had yours. I think the only thing we won't miss is having to dri drive his butt around everywhere. But actually, I'm going to miss that too. So what are you going to do now? You know, they always tell you when you testify, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. And I can honestly say, I don't know what to do now. You see, when he died, part of me died with him. And I know it's selfish in me to think of how it affects me, but I have this emptiness now that nags at me. And I know that part's irreplaceable, so I'm never gonna be the same again. I'm just gonna have to learn how to live differently. But as much as this pains me, my sorrow is with the family who now have to figure out how to live differently without their wonderful son, brother, uncle, husband, and daddy. We need to keep them close in our hearts and minds. Hold on to those priceless memories and always remember to cherish every moment we have with each other because I've learned the hard way. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I guess the only sure yet unfortunate thing to do is become a stinking Sooners fan. This was a snippet of who Brandon was and why we loved him so dearly. All three of us brainstormed. We realized we could write a book about Brandon and maybe someday I might just do that. Maybe it might be titled A Groupie of One. Brandon, you were loved by so many and such a big part of our lives. We cannot thank you enough for being there whenever we needed you. It was an honor to know you, to serve alongside you, and to be able to call you friend. So Rat Patrol is 10-7. Collins is 10-7. Come back on that.
This is uh, the funeral song by Band of Horses. It is an American rock band, um, alternative rock song written by the band. And you just heard uh, Master Deputy Ross Caps with Tim and Chris by his side talking about nicknames. And at the end, you heard him say, Rat Patrol is 10-7 and Collins is 10-7. And it is presumed those are the nicknames for Master Deputy Brandon Collins. And 107 is the police code for out of service. Show. 